Do you ever feel that your life is fragmented, composed of many different disjointed pieces without a common thread or narrative that connects them? After a while, these scattered pieces can become quite overwhelming as they tug at you and at your psyche in all different directions. Well, there's a tremendous, powerful, Kabbalistic concept. It's called the Divine Sparks, which we will discuss. Deciphering the Divine Sparks is the name of this program, which will help you understand your life in completely new ways. To help you find that elusive unity, unifying element that can connect the different details of our entire lives. Please join me, deciphering the divine sparks. Hi, this is Simon Jacobson, and welcome to a topic which may sound esoteric and mystical, but actually has tremendous per, per practical implications in addressing some of our most compelling challenges. It's called Deciphering the Divine Sparks. Do you ever feel that your life is fragmented, made up of many different disjoint, disjointed pieces, parts, that have nothing in common? You know, you wake up in the morning, you press the snooze button, you finally get out of bed, whatever regimen it may be, you exercise, you have a coffee, you take a shower, commute, or work from home, many details. And most of them have no connection between one and the next. Now, it doesn't sound like much, but this can accumulate day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, millennium, century after century, millennium after millennium. We did go through, we went and entered the third millennium 21 years ago. And it accumulates and can become quite overwhelming. Because in general, human beings loathe fragmentation. You see, even children, when they play with toys, and they try to fit different objects into different spaces, they look to fit them. We're always looking to organize. And when things become disorganized and fragmented, it ultimately takes its toll on our very comfort zones and our peace of mind and peace of heart. Sometimes in life, these disjointed pieces, as we look back, we sometimes see their connections. You know, mistakes we've made, setbacks, fired from a job, a divorce, or some other, at the moment, traumatic experience. And then when you look back, you say, well, that led me down a path to greater growth. So there are times that we're blessed where we see the connection between things that we didn't see that connection when it actually happened. But that's not necessarily uh, consistent. Kierkegaard put it this way. We can only understand our life backwards, but we have to live our lives forwards. So how does one find that deeper connection? Can one find this deeper connection? Enter the Kabbalistic concept, elaborate upon a Hasidic thought. And Hasidic is essentially Kabbalah for our times explained in rational, psychological, emotionally, spiritually relevant terms. Kabbalah itself can be like formulas and words that are very cryptic. And hence we're speaking about the, the concept of the divine sparks in Kabbalistic teachings, especially Rabbi Isaac Luria, the Holy Arizal, 15th century great mystic, 16th century, that explains this very eloquent concept 
And thus, the title of this conversation, Deciphering the Divine Sparks. As I said, those words alone, what does that mean? So let's put it into very simple English. Each one of us, as we enter this world, has a unique mission. And that mission is allocated to you through the idea of divine sparks, that whatever is going to happen in your life, whatever family you were born into, community, language you speak, the foods you eat, your culture, your religion, your social standing, the people you will meet, everything, every interaction, who you, your marriage, your family, your work, your entertainment, has divine sparks. See that as spiritual little pockets of energy encased, embedded, I would even say trapped in those activities. And it is your job to elevate, to discover, identify, elevate and refine that particular activity by looking at that divine spark. Now, what does that mean? Let's use an example. Think of uh, your favorite book, whatever that book may be, War and Peace, Les Miserables, <laughs> one of the classics, it can be whatever book it is. So a book is a long narrative. It begins on page one and concludes it can be 500 pages later, 1,000 pages, 300 pages, whatever that amount is. And when you're absorbed in reading the story, the narrative, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, even though it's made up of many letters and words and paragraphs and chapters and sections, yet it's one long narrative that emerges as you go. You don't know the plot until you read it. You know, some of us peek later, but the best way to read a book is you read it as the author intended it. And as it develops, sometimes we even look back to identify a character a piece of the narrative, start seeing the, the jigsaw puzzle come together. And that's what's called a good book. Many details, many characters, many personalities, many types of situations, encounters, drama, all leading to a story, a narrative. It could be many sub-narratives within the narrative. Let's say someone now takes this book and tears it up into small little pieces and scatters it everywhere. Now, you read the book, so you know the story. People start picking up these pieces and they see a word here and a word there. And if they come to you, you could say, oh yeah, that's a little piece of the story. What's the whole story? Well, you're going to have to gather them all together, all these little scattered fragments of the book, and piece it together until you get the story. The one who knows the story, who's read it, understands. But it's still... If you want to really recreate it, you need to see all those pieces. So the, Kabbal the Kabbalists put it this way. Existence itself is a book, is a divine narrative with millions of characters, not just in our generation, but in all generations. All of time and space is part of this narrative, both on Earth and, out on, and above Earth, beyond Earth, different planets, outer space, all part of a very very complex and elaborate comprehensive narrative. Most of us will not ever fathom or grasp all of the narrative. We may see some of it in our own lives play itself out and those around us. Intelligent people are seeking the narrative. They're looking around. They're not just living from moment to moment. But here's the story. Because the purpose of existence itself is for us to be partners with the author with the cosmic author of our narrative and of life's narrative. So it's concealed from us, the full story. So we come to this world and we just start living through life. We live forward and we start seeing these pieces accumulate. And very often they're completely fragmented. But we need to be wise and understand there's a narrative here. The Kabbalists take it even further. They give an example. You may have heard of this, the world of Toihu. The world of Toyu is refers to the second verse in the Bible after it says, in the beginning God created heaven and earth. And then it says, and the earth was Toyu Vavoyu. Some translate it as chaos and confusion, empty and void. It's a, it's a cryptic word as well that needs to be deciphered. But the Kabbalists call it the world of Toyu, that it's actually a, a, an archetype. It's in reality 
of a world where things are fragmented. And they actually use the expression that the energies and the containers, which I'll explain in a moment in this example that I'm giving, the energy and containers cannot live with one another. The tension is too much, and it creates what they call the shattering of the containers. Now, what is energy and container? So think, go back, let's go back to the book. Letters on the page are containers. They're just letters, whatever language they may be. The story they tell, the message, the idea they convey is the energy. Everything has energy and containers. It can be your body and your soul. It can be the mechanics of a particular organization and the spirit behind it. It can be form and function. The outer and the inner, the packaging and that which is within the package. So you can apply it anywhere. For example, in marketing or in even in education and communication, you can have a lot of energy, but if it's not conveyed properly, it's not packaged, the containers are weak, people won't get it. The other hand, you can have a great, beautiful package and there's nothing inside or very negligible. A good communicator, a good educator knows how to fit the right amount of energy in the right amount of words or containers or examples that are conveyed. So essentially, everything consists of energy and you could say spirit and matter, or energy and matter, will use spirit and matter. So what happens, however, if someone is a brilliant person, but has very few words, so people will be confused by what they're saying. The shattering of the containers is, a, is essentially the example I gave of the tearing of the book into many little fragments, and like dropping them from heaven down to earth. So now we have all these little pieces everywhere. And each one of us is allocated a certain amount of pieces of that story and that narrative in our lives. And our job is to gather, to identify, and to piece them together and create that one unified, seamless narrative, which is called your life. So even though things seem fragmented, they're just pieces of a larger story. So the first lesson is you need to look at your life that way. Everything that happens is part of your story. You may not see the entire picture, the entire chapter, but when you're looking for it, you will find it much faster than someone that's not looking for it. Many of us are just, we uh, resign ourselves or surrender to circumstances. Okay, circumstances, what can I do? But when you have an attitude, no, everything that's happening is part of the narrative. I just don't know the whole story, just like I haven't read the entire book. Or think of a film. I've only seen a few of the frames. I haven't seen the entire story yet. And my job and mission is to find that story. Then everything takes on a different meaning. You meet someone, nothing is random. Nothing is by accident. Everything is part of your narrative. However, that narrative has been now torn into pieces, so to speak. And that means discovering and elevating the divine sparks. These divine sparks are essentially the little pieces Sparks of light, sparks of energy that are there. Because remember, the narrative and its letters and words carry a story. The thing, the problem is that if you have, let's say, one paragraph torn into five parts, you just don't see the story. But that doesn't mean each piece doesn't have part of the story. Then you put it together. Like I said, a jigsaw puzzle, you piece it together. Ah, I now read the paragraph or the chapter or whatever section it is. And the story emerges. Emerges. It's not created. The beauty of it is, it puts an entirely different spin on our lives. Everywhere there is poetry and music. Everywhere there's a beautiful story. Some of the times the story has certain twists and turns. Sometimes they're painful as well. Like in any true narrative. However, there's the bigger picture. And that's what we're looking for. Now, from time to time in life, we may get a glimpse, like a bird's eye view of the bigger picture. And sometimes we don't, especially when we're overwhelmed emotionally by any particular challenging issue in our lives that can even be traumatic. So the emotions take over and it's hard to, and we, our, our vision becomes very myopic and it's hard for us to really appreciate everything going on as part of a larger story. And that's perfectly fine. It's also part of life. We don't always have to be in control. We don't always have to see it all. But you have to always keep in the back of your mind that the story is unfolding. And the beautiful part is that you are a partner in the unfolding drama of, and destiny of your own life. 
You can't control circumstances, as we discussed so many times, especially in the last year and a half. But you totally can control your attitude. And when you understand that deeper narrative, or that there is a deeper narrative, you're beginning to take control by recognizing, okay, the story is unfolding. And I look forward and I anticipate to see what emerges. But it's more than just watching, it's actually doing. Because as I said, the mission is for you to actually collect, collect these different specks or these, these sparks, the divine sparks, the divine pieces that are embedded in each part of our details of our lives. That's what they say, God is in the details, perhaps. <laughs> because the details make up the whole. And once you have the whole, there's a synergy that's more than just the sum of the parts. So that briefly is an example to help us decipher and understand the story, the mystery of the divine sparks. It's really about you, the sparks in your life. And as I go, I go back again, every aspect of your life, your personal life, your relationships, your work, profession, entertainment, travel, everything is covered by this. And you don't know ahead of, the time, ahead of time what the story is, but you know there's all these little pieces. So the first thing we do when we try to make sense of our lives, if you feel that you're living fragmented life and disjointed, is to say, okay, let me begin to recognize these are not just fragments. They look at like fragments. How do I piece them together? So the first thing is know yourself, know thyself by looking into what is my personality like? Some people have a creative personality. Some people are very um, cerebral. Some are emotional. Some people are very technical, good with their hands. Some people are good with numbers and data. Others loathe that. By identifying your personality, you're beginning to identify the narrative of your character. Then you look at the people around you, family, parents, siblings, your educators, your school, your friends, even people you get to meet later in life, co-workers, employees, employers, clients, investors, and spreading it further, the opportunities that have come your way, your, your way in your life. Your opportunities are different than mine. The places you've been to, where you were born, where you traveled, where you moved, perhaps. All, this are, are all these details are the fragments that we're talking about, but they all come together if you wish to do so. And when you're able to bring that all together, you begin to see a pattern emerging. And that pattern is the narrative of your life. So the divine, the divine sparks are not just some esoteric concept. They actually give us context, perspective on ourselves and the lives that we live. Guaranteed, it's a formula for living a much more meaningful, peaceful, and fulfilling life. When I say peaceful, I don't mean animal bliss. Absolutely, driven by ambition and with passion. But making sense, instead of being confused and overwhelmed by all the details, you see the details as part of that larger pattern, part of that larger narrative. Another good example, which I often use, is music. Music may even be better because music, a narrative is a beautiful story. Music also has another sense. We all relate to music. Music can be the same thing. You can take a beautiful symphony, a beautiful opera, beautiful piece of music, and someone can break it up into little pieces. You know, you have these different... You know, on radio or other things, they have these games and quizzes. They let you hear a one, a one, one note or just a few notes of a song and what song was it. So you can take a song, a beautiful song, break it into pieces. And when you do, those that know this song may be able to recognize or resonate in some way. But those that don't just have a bunch of pieces. They're all like, sounds like noise. Doesn't that like sound like our lives? But it's really music that has just been sh scattered. Pieces. Divine sparks that have been scattered. The containers shattering. Now we have all these shards, these pieces, and our mission is to put them together and the beautiful music that emerges. Now you can ask the question, if they were once once united, what's the point of breaking them that we may be able to shatter them and that we should be able to unite them? No, but something's added. When you unite them, first of all, the deep satisfaction and the deep fulfillment of bringing things together that were scattered or fragmented 
you cannot have when it was initially all connected. There's just a deeper pleasure. As we see, like treasure hunts and other things where we piece things together. Secondly, the mystics explain, the Kabbalists explain, that when you do that, you actually reach a higher state of the very narrative itself. Because now you've done something that was not there initially. Initially, there was no break. There was no scattering. There was no shattering. So using the Kabbalistic terms, the same idea, you've heard of the concept of tzimtzum, concealment, that when you bring the light into a dark black hole that, was, that concealed the light, the light is far stronger and far more powerful than it was originally. Because now it had to contend with fragmentation. So when you find harmony and synchronicity and in, in an integrated life, after fragmentation, besides the satisfaction, the deep satisfaction for the person, something on a cosmic level has also been changed. Because it's a far deeper narrative that has also now contended and dealt with concealment, fragmentation, the break. In other words, when you fix something after it's been broken, it's far stronger. Definitely spiritually. And you see this. Think of love. People love each other. Then there's been a betrayal. Some form of tr- trust has been, has been, uh, has been uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Someone betrayed your trust. Someone betrayed. I'm looking for another word. We've lost our trust. A schism in a beautiful relationship. And then we see them both, find, with, whether it's through a third party or two people who loved each other, reach reconciliation. And I'm not talking about just damage control. That reconciliation can lead to a deeper love than ever before. Like one of the expressions used, that, you, that a contract that's never been appealed or challenged is strong enough, but if it's been appealed and challenged and then upheld, you can't appeal again. Like it is with, let's say, the Supreme Court in the United States. In other words, till it wasn't challenged, you can say, okay, it's beautiful, but we don't know what will happen under stress. If it survives the stress and continues to thrive, that thriving is going to be a lot stronger because you had to dig deeper. Anyone in recovery and healing will tell you that. Some even say, I don't regret what happened because it brought me to a place I would never be. It's hard to imagine that when you haven't gone through it, but the many, I hear that very often. In other words, there are dimensions of experience that happen only after something has been shattered and rebuilt. Now, I don't wish that upon anyone, but we all live in a world, as I said, that we have those shattered containers. So they're not physical containers, but they're the physical pieces of your life everywhere. To be perfectly honest and personal, this is one of the driving engines in my own life. You go out there in the world and you see a lot of confusion, a lot of pain. Understanding this concept and internalizing it gives you a certain sense and perspective that allows you to ride through the waves, even the waves that are often very turbulent. The Baal Shem Tov, the great mystic, the 19th, 18th century. So he had a student and a colleague, his name was Rab Chaim Rappaport. I tell the story very often because it captures this in such a beautiful way. He sent them once on a mission to some city. We don't even know what the mission was. That's how the story evolves. More important, what happened afterwards comes back to the Baal Shem Tov, his master, his teacher. As, as mentor, he says to the Baal Shem Tov, mission accomplished. Baal Shem Tov says, can you tell me how you got to the location that you went to? How did you travel? Which seemed like trivial at this point. It's after the fact. Who cares what, how you travel? Baal Shem Tov insisted, Rabbi Chaim shared. Well, one night I, I slept in an inn. I went on this road, through this town, that town. Second night there was no inn, so I camped out at the side of the road. In the morning I woke up, I washed my hands, said prayers, and then sat down to eat something. There was a little brook of water at the side of the road. I went over, I filled up a cup, I made a blessing on the water and drank. The Baal Shem Tov jumped up with excitement and said, that brook of water 
was waiting there from the beginning of time, from the beginning of creation, for you to come and make a blessing. Think of that. That lesson is mind-blowing, in my opinion. I've traveled many places in this world, and I always remember this story. I've been to places with, I don't know, if there was a person that looks like me there before. You know, there's Robert Frost's beautiful poem, The Road Less Traveled, that I arrived at a, at a fork in the road that diverged. And one was a road that you can see was traveled on. And I, I took the, less, the road less traveled. And that has made all the difference. There's something exciting, dynamic, about forging a new path. Yes, when you walk in the grass, and you see this is a path many people have walked. It's easier. It's more proven, perhaps more secure. But there's something about going to the grass that nobody has walked on yet. And I don't just mean this physically, I mean it also figuratively. We all have our unique strengths, our unique voice. You know, I often quote that statement, you were born an original, don't become a copy. Or the famous poem, poem called Voiceless, where he begins, alas to those that die with their song still inside them. Each of us has a song. When I said a song, I said earlier music, a narrative, a song. But it's more than just a short song. It's your entire life. But we become so trapped in circumstances or what others want and expect and demand, conformity, that we, we just travel on someone else's road. But your road the entire existence from the beginning of time is waiting for you to come arrive there and redeem, free the trapped spark that only you can free. And it's not just once. Every aspect, every second, every moment of your day, of your life, every encounter, every interaction has those sparks. So there's one thing, just that, that even finding one spark is so refreshing all of existence has been waiting for you to do that but imagine when it accumulates into that narrative all those sparks and you gather them together creating unity in a place of fragmentation discovering harmony within diversity that my friends is a life worth living because you aren't just being successful in whatever way you define success whether it's building a beautiful family, which is great, making an excellent living, being comfortable, enjoying the things you enjoy. You know, we have many blessings in our lives, but there's a whole other story going on. The deeper narrative. Why are you here? Are you doing what existence is waiting for you to finish that piece of this narrative that only you can write or only you can recreate? That is the biggest question of all. And it's not a contradiction. A successful life is beautiful. But an ultimate purposeful life, a meaningful life that has all these elements, that is the real reason why we are here. So the divine sparks is just another way of saying the spiritual and emotional and psychological opportunities everywhere scattered in your life these are sparks waiting to be freed because often they're very deeply trapped. Michelangelo said when he was asked, how do you carve, how do you sculpt those beautiful angels in the marble? And he said, I see the angels trapped in the marble and I carved and carved and set them free. Our sparks are embedded, trapped in marble, in concrete, in other materials, you can fill in the blanks. And then that becomes our story. But that's not the story. The story is carving away the excess, carving away the means 
to discover the end. I'm not talking about eliminating anything in your life. It's just looking deeper what's behind the curtain, under the dashboard. What's the narrative that lies in all these scattered different letters, words, phrases, paragraphs, chapters? What's the music that is more than the sum of the parts that accumulates from the little different experiences in your life. So to put it in very basic terms, maybe very beautiful poetic terms, every second of your life is part of a song, and you can make that song come alive. So no matter what happens, even if it's a moment that it was very painful or uncomfortable, it's also part of the song. It's up to you to turn it into, or to reveal the music in it, to reveal the larger music in it. Can we do that 24-7? Do we have that presence? Do we have that focus and persistence? Each in our own way. Begin somewhere. Begin in the morning, when you wake up in the morning, before you take on the day. That moda'ani, prayer or meditation or chant, thank you for returning my soul to me. What are you basically saying? That your soul is the center, the hub, and everything else are the spokes. All the details are about the story of your soul. So it creates that focus, that laser focus. Then when you take on the day and everything you're doing, you can find the thread that connects them all. So the disjointed, fragmented pieces, suddenly you suddenly see the connection. Yeah, there's no connection between tying your shoelaces and a business meeting you'll have later in the afternoon. Tying your shoelaces in the morning, a business meeting later in the afternoon. Yes, you want your shoes on. But what's the connection? But we understand that all of it has been waiting for you since the beginning of time in some way to reveal the spark. Then even the tying of a shoelace is part of that. Because you understand that's part of the purpose. And there can be a lesson in a shoelace, there can be a lesson in a shoe. I'm not going into all the details. But it's being present and living deliberately. There's no such thing as accents, not just things that we just do by rote. Everything is infused, even a drink of water. So firstly, it's infused with a deeper purpose. You're not just drinking because you're thirsty. Deeper purpose that the strength you'll gather from the drink or from the food will help you be a kinder person, give you that strength. And also that is part of a larger narrative. Can I tell you what that narrative is right now? That's the job each of us has to do. But then it becomes part of the larger story, not just as a means, not just as a separate ent- entity, but all part of the narrative, exactly as it is in any good book, any good piece of music, that even the seemingly trivial detail is part of that larger narrative. Because it's about you fulfilling your purpose in this world, which is spiritualizing the material world in which you are, the section, the corner of the material world, which you are blessed with and given. And yes, there are lessons in everything. And then there are lessons in how they accumulate together to tell a larger story. So when you come to the end of the day, you can look back and say, oh, I didn't just do a bunch of fragmented things. They're all part of a larger story, my soul's mission in this world. And wherever I go, the common denominator is, have I used that for something positive? To be kinder, to be gentler, to be more giving, to serve another. Everything is under that rubric. Everything is united by that principle. Despite their different details, a myriad of details, multitude of details. This, my friends, is a short synopsis of the mystery of the story deciphering the divine sparks in our personal lives. I hope I did justice to it. Most importantly, the best litmus test is if you can implement it in your life. That going from here, you can look at yourself, look at your events, and take a piece of paper, write down things you're doing, and try to find those threads. And try to find the deeper meaning in each one of them. And then the threads, or whatever order. Slowly, some things you may not find connections. Maybe talk to a mentor, talk to a friend, they can help. But even by beginning that process, even thinking in that direction changes everything. 
and hopefully you can implement it and bring it and execute it in your life in every possible way to live a more unified, more harmonious, and a more wholesome life. Because as I said earlier, nature abhors confusion, and so does the human psyche. It ultimately drains us. Whereas when we find harmony, then the details become part of a bigger picture. Be blessed. This has been Simon Jacobson, Meaningful Life Center. Go to MeaningfulLife.com, please, where you can find many other such programs. Very diverse, very robust menu of different options, all about finding meaning, deeper meaning in your life, discovering your mission and tools of how to implement it. That's our mission. Please join me for other programs. Please share with friends and colleagues and others, as well as give us your feedback, your suggestions, your thoughts. Because at the end of the day, we are also part of the story now that we're speaking to each other. Even though I'm doing the speaking, you're doing the listening. But I want to hear from you. And we need each other. We intersect and create a deeper synergy, a higher, a greater symphony of cosmic music. So we too are pieces of one larger narrative. Besides all the details in our lives, all of us. And if we can join together, 8 billion or almost 8 billion and counting, can you imagine? Be well. Thank you so much. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com donate.